Hey, this is Chuck with Life in Michigan, and I'm talking to Fred Biltman, Seth Thompson, and Kyle Bice. And they have just put out a documentary. Well, it hasn't just come out, but it's recently released a documentary called The Great Beer State. And that documentary is about the uh, Michigan Brewers Guild uh, history from its formation, which has an anniversary coming up, uh, the 25th anniversary coming up in October 22nd. And it chronicles the formation of the guild, its ongoing evolution, as well as the evolution of the beer industry and uh, you know beer culture in Michigan. Uh, does that kind of summarize what the, the documentary is about for you guys? Yeah, I think that I would say our intention, um, you know, it's been, uh, it's involved a couple of different guild engaged projects. And I think our intention is to tell the story of sort of the modern Michigan craft brewing movement through the lens of telling the story of the Michigan Brewers Guild, which is then told through telling the stories, um, sharing stories from Michigan breweries. So it's it's sort of all three of those things held lightly or loosely. Yeah. And, and you guys have built off of, so Fred, I know that you wrote a book, uh, The Rising Tide, which was stories of the Michigan Brewers Guild, uh, along yep. with some awesome photography from Kyle. Um, that book came out in, I think, 2019. And yeah, then... and that was, the, that was the beginning of this process, really. Okay. And uh, Scott, executive director of the Michigan Brewers Guild, and I had been conspiring or waxing for a long time that we wanted to um, begin to document and capture some of the stories of the people that made up our community. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to kind of, you know, we had a recognition that, uh, it was an important time to do so, um, both before the community changed or we lost people or what have you, right? Um, and lost track of that story and what had happened over the last, at that time, you know, 20 some years and now 25. Um, because it's a remarkable change in landscape. Now, there's a whole, there are whole other stories that can be told if you, you know, want to look at pre prohibition or prohibition or yeah. the early days of brewing and. That's kind of where I was framing the lens is that our look is really um, meant to celebrate from 1997 forward uh, when when the guild came to be. And by doing that, we kind of start in the, in the as early as 82 when we start talking about uh, Chelsea Ale House um, and um, the real ale company, sorry, and Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and you know, and Bells and Kalamazoo Brewing Company and um, the people that kind of were moving into commercial brewing before the license change that happened in 92. So our stories from 97 to now, it starts with a little precursor of here's how these characters yeah, uh, had a running start into 97. Nice. And so um, the, so uh, the documentary I got to see like the first viewing of that was during the summer beer fest. Uh, since then, you, the the documentary has been uh, doing some viewing parties. It's been it's making its way through the breweries that are hosting viewing parties. Uh, I think there's a bunch going on this week. Um, but I was kind of curious about the the backstory of like how did the three of you come together to be working on the documentary? Yeah, so I'll, I'll field that one again to get started and then I'd love to hear you guys share your perspectives on, on what it looked like from your point of view. Mm -hmm. Kyle and I, um, you know, kind of met through his wife, Natanya, and I was looking for an illustrator at New Holland when I was um, there as a partner and responsible for the marketing. And we started working together and became deeper collaborators and then started working on individual projects together. Um, and I, Kyle can share his background, but there was a bit of a hybrid between illustration work and photography and videography coming in. And that I crossed over to a lot of my uh, pursuits as well. And so we worked on a project together called This Craft Nation, and that headed into, um, I had begun doing a lot more interview style stuff both with new holland and then and then as this craft nation and seth and i met through another collaborator uh 
Jeff Haig at Green Frog Photo, who had been doing a lot of beer and food photography with me. And eventually, uh, Seth saw a shoot and our interests uh, align in an interesting way. And so when we, we had designs on this craft nation, uh, it is up as a podcast and it was a book project that has, that hasn't quite completed itself yet. But um, we crossed the country to talk to makers, to talk about what's the difference, uh, why go through the trouble of, of uh, continuing to defend ind independent makers of things. Yeah. What does that look like? And what's the story there? And um, we would bring the green frog crew in when we, wanted to support with video but we didn't have a budget to do to video the whole thing um or really we didn't have the grasp yet <laughs> so uh, but from there i think you know relationships and strengths and and interests were discovered and so when we did a rising tide we did what was it 35 or so interviews at four or five different locations and at that time it was a book project, but I was using audio to record interviews so that I could be present and not take notes. And Kyle was, his primary responsibility was stills for the book. And then we had the instinct to say, well, let's put everything we can in the vault. Let's try to record that audio quality that could be used later which has been in the podcast and may as well try and even though we don't really have the budget for it let's try and capture some video so um from there when when this idea came for the great beer state documentary for the 25th we had all that footage that had been being put to work uh in the podcast but we decided to create a little different structure and bring seth on board both as um, you know, a videographer with a different level of experience, that also includes we really leaned on his editing uh, nice. as well as shooting and capturing. So I'll hand it off to you guys to see what it looked like from your point of view. If I missed anything, well, yeah, I, I was trying to remember how we met, and it must <laughs> must have been. I mean, I remember that was kind of a tumultuous time in my life, so it's not surprising that I don't remember details. But was that may maybe the Nashville trip for this craft nation was the first time we? Uh, yeah, it was, was first. It was Nash was Nashville and Louisville, right? At the same time, like that same stop. And Detroit. Detroit. And Detroit. Detroit yeah, was Nashville. first when we did Third Man. Places. But I had met you, Seth, on a previous shoot. We just hadn't really worked independently on a project together, and wow. then. So Detroit and then Nashville, uh, Louisville were your first intersections with Kyle, I think. Yeah. And that was, um, Seth came in sort of after my New Holland days and as we were starting this craft nation. So it was the birth of this craft nation, like right when we were getting on the road for that trip. Very cool. Awesome. And I'll share a little bit of the why there that might be a good story in terms of why and how we got together is that I think with this type of work, both this audience and, and maybe this type of work in general, uh, I'm sure there's different styles of shooting and capturing for lack of a better word, but you know, we're heading into areas, especially when we're near or adjacent to a festival, sometimes we're a little more planned, but certainly with this craft nation, we don't know where we're gonna be shooting we may know who, but there may be more. We may get an idea or meet somebody that changes the course of the story. So the story of our process is changing as we try to uncover the story that we're there to find. And so I think there's a certain recognition between people. I recognize it from music as well which is there's a recognition when you see people with a similar appetite and willingness to go into the unknown and say, uh, quick, we got to move over here, reset stuff up. Yeah. Let's we don't have this. We don't have that. Right. We're at, we're starting at a disadvantage. There, uh, there's a certain kinship when you see people whose eyes dig into that and lean into it instead of lean away. And you start saying, I want them on my team. At least I do. 
Right. Instead That's of running awesome. away going, no, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. Certainly in the filming world, that scenario you just described is panic inducing for a lot of people. And I've I've noticed even people that otherwise are are fun to work with, uh that level of who even knows what's gonna about to happen really throws people off. And even if you pull it off, you can you can kind of tell later that the the crew was ha having just <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> and that's uh well not only for for me there's not not only that technical aspect that Fred and Kyle there's there's no problem with just jumping and hoping your parachute opens. That's fine. <laughs> Actually, maybe, maybe that's even preferable. <laughs> oh, but maybe it's even preferable. Um, but but also once we get there, uh, it, I think this is true for all three of us. But I notice it most with Fred with interviewing is that yeah we're you know in this case we're talking about beer but right but also we're, he's not gonna just throw you softball so that you can practice your talking points we're gonna we're gonna talk about who you are as a human who also works in the beer industry and that to me that that's everything right there because i don't give a shit about the talking points i hate when you yeah. can tell someone has practiced what they want to say because yeah. you're not going to get you're going to get marketing yeah you're not going to get a real story and fred's good at pulling that from people who came with their with their talking points <laughs> so did you do you feel and i, I think that uh what we just said seth is really true uh particularly when you watch the documentary because you get a sense of not just somebody like rattling off their history or their, um, their byline, you know, when they're like, so for example, uh, talking to the graphs, you know, about Arbor Brewing, um, I didn't feel like that was necessarily anything that they had from their byline. It's more, more about their experience. Did you feel like, um, well, I guess it was the question is, um, was that one of the highlights for you guys in putting together this documentary is, is trying to dig into those stories and pull out those nuggets? Uh, to share um, what, what were the for each of you like the the highlights for putting the documentary together I, that's definitely the best part for me as the editor how about you Kyle um oh man that's uh that could be a very <laughs> lengthy answer uh, <laughs> um you know the best parts of it honestly was uh, having the history that I have with Michigan beer even though I'm not a Michigander you know like having worked with New Holland for, I don't know, five or six years, however long I was there um, doing labels, I met a lot of people in the beer business. So yeah. coming over from Chicago and being able to hang out with those folks again and meeting some new people and hearing stories from the mouth of the people where, who actually experienced it instead of, you know, the, the bar stories that you would hear right. um, from people who weren't there, you know, <laughs> it's kind of cool to hear that stuff all come together um, in front of the camera and having Fred with his experience asking those those questions um, and getting answers that I think somebody who wouldn't who doesn't know those people wouldn't get you know so Fred was getting the the really good juicy answers yeah um, from yeah. all of his interviews well Fred you're you're sort of like the the historian for Michigan beer really so, <laughs> that's how I think yeah I was like a uh, I was in awe when I first met Fred because I was like holy shit this guy's a rock star you know um, and uh, so it's very cool. I'm just kind of oh, thanks. Boring right I, now. <laughs> I appreciate it. And uh, I'm really proud to have been around the community and mostly because I'm proud of what the community has accomplished. And historian is high praise. I, I like, I think that part of that really fits with me. And then part of it, I kind of veer off to maybe, I don't know what, lean into storyteller or, yeah. you know, somebody has been around because I have respect for historians who are really documenting a granular detail, uh, like archivists and stuff. Like there's another yeah. level that, that I can't hang with. To me, I'm, and this is why this project is sort of 
good for me is that I'm really drawn to finding the intersections of story, finding the, the turning points of the community and finding where that lives in the individual stories, which is much different going back to what Seth was saying than, you know, talking points are like, tell me everything about your brewery can really miss where it intersects with the community or the other brewery or when did somebody come in or what what when were the big moments yeah when were those um you know when did the impact characters arrive or and like stories have arc too so there's um meaning i guess i want to shift to saying one thing i was thinking as we were going through this is that there are maybe three or four stories when you look at michigan breweries if you look at archetype you know home brewer wants to grow up become a real brewer finds a location gets a partner opens yeah. up home uh beer lover has a trip gets inspired by another place and says i want to bring that culture to my community uh restaurateur wants to uh, open up and add brewing because they like making things and i'm not minimalizing that at all but if we just told that story 30 times yeah you'd have these little differences between them. But to me, the, 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 um, the part that's both gratifying and meaningful is talking about, well, what the heck happened in Michigan that made this story so different than the state next door? Yeah. Um, why, how is it that we have this feeling when we're at events? What is the feeling? How did it come to be? Why don't, why are we talking to each other and maybe some, other community doesn't have a festival or or don't know each other at opposite and say you know i have we have friendships that are 10 hours away yeah because of our joint interest in making this community um something special so i like to sort of walk around that and try to find the things that are gonna bring that to life and it's not a one literal answer it's it's found in the spaces sometimes yeah for sure. I mean, I, I know for a fact, um, just being a, a beer lover, um, loving the, the state of Michigan, being involved, just going to the festivals and meeting people, I've made so many great friends. Like you said, 10 hour relationships. You know, I've got friends up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, friends over in Ishpeming, friends over in Grand Rapids, all uh, from them, you know, being part of um, Michigan beer, you know, and I'm not a brewer or anything like that, but just um, that I think that's part of what I love about the documentary is that I'm super interested in, and I think a lot of, um, I wouldn't say, oh, I don't know, I'm just going to speak my, for myself. I think uh, that I find a lot of satisfaction in getting that story, the stories that you guys have uncovered in the documentary to understand, like, why did so and so want to open this brewery? What were the challenges that, that they ran into? Um, what did they love about it? One story that I keep hearing over and over again is about the community. It's not just about the brewers themselves and the community they have, but that relationship that they make with um, with their community that they reside in. Uh, I think that's a really cool thing that that uncovers is, and I almost think that it could be explored further as there's um, that, you know, how bells, brought Kalamazoo, you know, onto the map, how, um, you know, little towns have these great little breweries and they're like little hometown things like being down in original gravity in Milan or something like that. Um, and I'm not exactly sure where I was going with that other than espousing how awesome I think the brewery is. Well, <laughs> I, hear what you, is. I hear what you're saying and it's parallel to a path that we were definitely exploring, which is, um, how, breweries and or the brewing community started to impact community itself yeah and how it went from i don't think we want a brewery in our town to can we please get a brewery in our town <laughs> um and that went to uh we're so proud to have these breweries in our town and what they've done for our culture and community and so and now it's why we keep seeing growth in terms of breweries is because there's apparently no town too small to welcome a brewery and so breweries that never or towns that never had a brewery are getting their first and towns that had one might be getting their second and third yeah 
And I think that I, um, Kyle will probably chuckle as I enter this phrase instead of somebody else bringing it, uh, which is, you know, people talk about saturation all the time and I'm a staunch uh, advocate that it's a hypothetical mystical thing that can evaporate as soon as you don't believe in it right because if the community believes there's room for another brewery there's an there's room yep. um, yeah for sure and we don't say they we have too many restaurants there should never be any restaurants <laughs> exactly we need to stop opening restaurants it's is the restaurant meaningful to your community are people drawn to go to it do they gain something more than food yeah um and i think the pandemic really poked at that a lot is that we started asking questions about which places are meaningful to us right so and anyway so community and our and the and the collective community of brewers impact on it was a was a big thread that we tried to follow yeah no i think it, it um, um because a lot of a lot of the interviews that were used in the documentary uh were from year, years ago uh you know what we're going to be podcast yeah <laughs> and so i obviously wasn't there so i'm watching it for the first time when it's time to edit it and not only like what fred said with the, the impact on the community that they live in uh the the lack of animosity between brewers was frankly kind of shocking because they are they are your competitors tech, yeah tech, uh and instead of win at all costs you're like oh you're short on hops here we'll send a truck over and do it up and that was <laughs> that was amazing to me yeah. and that is such a repetitive story it's almost like oh this old chestnut again <laughs> Uh, like meaning, and if you look at it one way, it's like every single one oh, of them. Yeah. Oh, we're gonna get the bag of grain story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, think about what that means for a community to have adopted that, that it's so normalized that it's in everyone's story, whether they opened uh two years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah. They there's an established norm that if you need something, you call your neighborhood brewery. Yep. That's I, that's become so normal for us that we don't, I don't even think about it until, you know, a project like this sort of brings it forward and, and, uh, has you, has us anyways, uh, digesting it in a different way of finding a way to portray that significance without having it said 30 times in a film. Right. And like, that's this, it brings us back to like, in terms of our project, what our goal is and challenges is how do we tell the story? without telling all of the stories. There's yeah. also this nature of we've got, I don't, I can't remember for over 400 breweries right now, um, certainly upper 300s and um, we can't tell 300 stories. Um, <laughs> we had a hard, we tried to get this to an hour, you know, we got to an hour six um, and we cut breweries out that and people out that we had talked to. Um, so there's this ongoing challenge. And I think, I think where I'm getting to with it is like the Michigan story is so dense that um, with good things and, and interesting stories that you have to find a way to elevate. What's the bigger arc? Why is this different? Yeah. And I, I'll pause for a second. I wanted to get to that earlier question about what was most gratifying and we talked about the normalization of this camaraderie mm -hmm. and how commonplace it is. There's a whole story about the 10 minutes before the interview with the governor, which was, uh, oh. which was going to our earlier point about we had to, you know, we learned about that interview the morning of and had a location change 10 minutes before. And then we're told you got three questions. <laughs> and so that was the thing with a different crew. We don't, get anything meaningful there um and so i was really grateful for that but the story i meant to tell was when governor whitmer is telling us how remarkable the camaraderie in the industry is 
and how people think for you to win, somebody's got to lose and that's not so. And this is an example. Yeah. That as a, as the person working on a documentary felt great, but really as a member of the brewing, mm -hmm. brewing community, that was like a tearful moment of like, we used to have to beg for somebody to believe we were a legitimate business. The governor's telling us we're an example yeah. uh, to be looked at for camaraderie. Yeah, that, that, that was, uh, that was great because, uh, it, it, like you said, it showcases, you know, where, uh, brewing communities, uh, brewers in, in general have, uh, impacted the community. Right. So that's yeah. getting out there beyond just, uh, the, the people making the beer. Uh, yeah. I was I was wondering, you know, so I'm sure that in making that there was well, there was definitely a ton of work in putting all this together, um, having to edit it down to just an hour and a little over an hour. But what were the the biggest challenges for each of you in making this as you were going through the process of making the documentary? And uh, I'll start with Kyle. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a weird one out of left field, but. Um... The second half, so we, it was kind of filmed in two parts um, over I don't know, a couple of years, Fred, like we, we started pretty early on and yeah. got some stuff with, with rising tide um, that ended up getting used, I think a little bit in the finished film. Yeah. I think we started um, in the fall of 18. Yeah. And um, about two years after that, or a year and a half after that, I got diagnosed with celiac. So I had to stop drinking beer. <laughs> while we we're filming this thing which was like just getting punched in the heart you know like, <laughs> so that was you know a physical challenge more than anything right. else but yeah it was, it was a big challenge to show up for these interviews and like yeah. watch everybody enjoying the, the good times <laughs> and having a drink and uh, now i can't do that now <laughs> oh man yeah that would that would be, be punishing for me as well <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh uh or seth how about you uh for me, the most challenging part was, um, well, definitely it was the edit. Um, one is, uh, first of all, I, I think the first time we we cut it first for content before we cut it for time, and I'm pretty sure that we were at like five hours, <laughs> so. <clears throat> and so now you know and, and that was all that was all like any any one of these could be in the in the final piece but you need to take a chainsaw to it and cut it down by 75 percent or 85 percent um luckily i've been at this long enough that i don't i'm not precious about the footage or what, whatever, because because if you go on, nobody cares that you really like that one. Everyone's like looking at their watch, so right. it, it checked out. But but that was just getting it down to that hour six was was tough, and it was you know at the end that those are the really tough parts because it feels like you've trimmed all the fat off of it, and well, shit, we're still at an hour twenty five. Right. How do we get 15 more minutes off of this thing? <laughs> uh, but the the other thing that you learn by beating your head against the wall over the years doing this is that it can always be trimmed down more. And it ends up being that, that piece that you really didn't think could possibly come out. You just decided to try it and it turns out that it, it's a tighter interview now and it works again. But the other challenge for me it was all technical uh, was, you know, over the course of, I think, five years, I think the earliest footage that I had was 2019, which would make sense with what yeah. time I said, but um, over the years, well, that's, th that's three years, maybe there was some older stuff in there, but, you know, at, at first, the fact that there's footage at all was just because Fred and Kyle were like, well, we have a camera that could shoot that. You want to just throw that up there and do that. And you're in all sorts of environments. Right. Uh, sometimes windy, sometimes 
you can hear the HVAC. Now you've cut all those together and you can't all of a sudden get blasted by. Right, right. Uh, there's a bunch of seagulls in that one. <laughs> and, you know, so just trying to even that out so that everything's about level that that takes a long time and you know luckily yeah. there's software now that can that does a good job of cleaning that up yeah uh, but even still that there's like a second audio edit that nobody even knows about that was necessary because i needed to go in and even everybody up as much as i could before i brought it back into the video and then so that yeah that is something you don't you don't think about and i didn't think about it until you just talked about it is that audio leveling because it's um because like you said you know there's all different kinds of conditions you guys were in um from either you know like you said hvac or um i think in one interview i remember hearing uh, i think it was at the up beer fest you could hear the um bagpipes going or something in the yeah background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah there's a good uh, easter egg in there too if you look <laughs> for the guys dancing before whoever we were interviewing i can't remember there's a couple of guys that dance and then walk off look for that that's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, favorite part that audio that you're talking about that's after i ran it through and crushed the bagpipes down to nothing <laughs> the original stuff it was like a duet between the but a trio between Fred, the interviewee, and the bagpipes. They were all, they were all pretty even, evenly matched. Yeah, that's um, awesome. <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, so, Fred, how about you? What was the most challenging part of putting the documentary together? Well, I think I think there's probably there's several. I think if I lean into two, one would be. Um, it's it's maybe a challenge, but it's also a compliment and, and maybe encouragement for other people is that, you know, the challenge of cutting was very real, especially because Seth's not precious, but I know these people, I've been recording interviews for however years. I like to think I'm not precious, but the reality is somebody's going to be, right? Yeah, yeah. Because ah, that's there for a reason. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so you can get attached to it and and... I would say the first couple layer, like I'm also familiar as a musician and a writer, um, you know, both involve some brutal editing at times. And and so I've learned the value of, of cutting and taking away. So I believe in it. But on the other hand, that was challenging. The last ones were super challenging. But I'll say that it's also an argument for like, the conversations we could have during the edit were because we trusted one another and we could hear one another. So Seth could tighten an interview as he would if he, if it was in a vacuum, an interview of itself. Yeah. But I might come in and say, no, what's being said in this interview isn't said in any of the other chapters by any other people. This is, it's not the best part of this interview. It's the important part of this interview for the mosaic of the whole. And Seth wouldn't have that picture. So it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. a, there's was no fault thing about him not seeing it, but that was my responsibility was to stand up for the things that needed it because they were fulfilling a role, not within that interview. Yeah. Um, well, and there, I don't know, remember the specific examples, but I just, we had some big epiphanies of like, you know, having to come back. And I was really surprised at my memory sometimes because I would look at a new edit and be like, I'm missing the tail end of that sentence. Yeah. I know, and you know, I could almost say it verbatim, but would have to go scrub the last version to find it. And be like, no, we got to let them finish that sentence. That's that's why the whole thing is there in the first place. Right. Um, well, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that Fred mentioned that because I was going to follow up. I, I just remembered right before Fred started talking about the same thing is that another challenge was. Not, not. I don't mean challenge like conflict, but between yeah. Fred and I, there were, there were, there were points in that edit where I knew that we had to get the time down significantly, and I would, to to try to save time, I would try to pre-edit before I presented it to Fred, and there there was there was a a week or so in that edit process where every 
it, what it felt like was every time I thought to myself, well, that, that can go, that, that's cool. We'll get two minutes back. And then I send it to Fred and he's like, well, but that was the one part. That was the one thing that needed to stay. And then I was just like, well, fuck it. I, I actually don't know what I'm doing because I'm cutting out. I'm doing like an anti edit. <laughs> all, all the stuff that I cut is all the stuff that Fred wants. You were like a water, one of those wooden water finders. Yeah. Keep cutting. I found out what was essential. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, really, know you, I don't know what you got till it's gone. It was very <laughs> helpful. And then I think the other challenge I'd point to, which is, um, you know, I don't, I didn't go to documentary school or film school. Right. I do, I feel like I have a, you know, studied certain things and have um, sort of developed my own perspective on it and storytelling. So I don't know if this method is, I feel like it's the hardest way to do it, but I, I keep finding myself defending it, which is we're going out capturing things, not knowing the points we want to make. So if we had, if we had determined the structure of this, right. said, here's the chapters we want to do. Here's what I need from this interview. I could have a much sharper interview and have less footage. Um, but on the other hand, a 30-minute interview often gets the person into their zone and gets them uh, relaxed and, and speaking from memory instead of sort of talking points and telling their stories personally instead of trying to say what the interviewer is looking for. So that length in the footage, for one, usually gets more if, if you can still direct it into meaningful stuff. But on the other hand, you know, we ended up with several quality interviews, maybe saying the same thing, and we're going to use one of them. Right. And so the cutting room floor is brutal there, but also it's just overwhelming to have this much in the can and then think about going through it to find counting on both your memory or annotations. Like we had Emily Bennett on board for Rising Tide, who did a great job kind of annotating the interviews so I could see. I, I could see a written form of, oh, this is where we hit that subject. I'm going to go there. Right. But um, so it's a technique that involves just take, you know, collecting a thousand pounds and needing a hundred. But I feel like for unscripted exploration into, I wonder what, yeah. in order to be curious, instead of dictate my opinion on what happened. I feel like it has a lot of value to say, I'm not going to dictate what story is out there. We're going to go out and try and find it. And we're yeah. finding it by asking questions. And I'm not even thinking about assembling. I'm not thinking about what it means to the whole. I'm just trying to ask questions and, and hear voices and perspectives. Yeah, that's the key. That's a really hard way to go. Well, and that, you know, as you guys are talking, that's what I was thinking is, uh, you know, for me, uh, being an outsider to the process is what I would find the hardest is that it's like you said a volume of work right all these different stories and then you're trying to winnow it down and you really don't have a um a script per se of what that story is you but you you know a general kind of feeling for what you want to get across right history of the guild plus where it's going and the people involved yeah. and like you said there's so many stories there's you know hundreds of breweries hundreds of stories all these little nuances and uh, yeah, I can't imagine. Well, I think you guys did a great job in the documentary I, of picking we, that out. When we first started, so we have everything collected, but but I haven't started anything yet. Yeah, I'm looking at that list. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god, there's no possible way that we can even scrub through all this stuff. Because I think it was something like 75 interviews. Oh my god, it, it was a it was a lot yeah uh, um and then you know some people are re-interviewed over the intervening years and so in my head because i haven't met these people yet i don't know who they are uh you know and fred is like oh well just you pick up rob from i'm like who's i don't know who that is <laughs> but uh, it was really intimidating to get started but once you you know once you get started the process sort of reveals itself but yeah 
when you're sitting there with basically a blank page, you're like, this is, this is, this, uh, I'm not Sisyphus. I can't keep pushing the rock up the hill. <laughs> but I can't have Fred coming back saying, you cut the wrong shit again. <laughs> oh, but also related to what Fred was saying earlier is that something that I've found, and it was, I don't think it was employed in this project per se, probably because Fred is naturally a person that would direct a conversation like this. But uh, my experience with unscripted interviews is is the same. You're you you're gonna what you want is you know maybe some bullet points to make sure you don't get way off in the weeds. Right. Especially if it's for a client who's looking for a different a specific thing. Yeah. But they're it's unscripted with un they're not actors or media personalities so you, you just say we're gonna sit we're just gonna don't worry about the cameras you and i are just gonna have a conversation and and then what i often do is say okay we're we've got everything we can cut now right don't don't cut <laughs> uh, they think you cut and i have projects over the years that everything that made it into the final cut was after I lied and said we, that we had cut <laughs> because now the pressure's off and now right. you get real, not only the real story, but their tone of voice changed. And now you get the real human talking to you and they say, and they go, they go usually go through and say the same stuff, but now they're not making sure that they're sitting up straight and they, yeah. And it's so much better. Yeah. I, I, th I find that in photography as well. And Kyle can probably yeah. say this too, is it's so much better if you've got a long lens and you can look at people from far away. Cause as soon as you bring it up to their face, they're like, yeah. you know, I got to pose for this. Um, so yeah. Well, that's where, yeah. go ahead, Kyle. Oh, I was gonna say one of the things that Fred and I learned, um, when we started TCN, uh, this craft nation is when we were interviewing people and it was primarily <clears throat> photographs more than video. Um, I would let Fred talk an interview for 10 minutes, maybe more before I started snapping pictures because I needed the, the uh, person being interviewed to relax because they would see that lens behind Fred, you know, behind one of his shoulders and they would tense up and not give the answers that he was looking for. Their face would be really rigid. You know, there was all this right. stuff that, that I had to wait for. And that transition, like I, I took that into rising tide as well. Like we did the exact same process that we, we had been practicing on the road before that. And yeah, then I noticed Seth had a very similar thing where like the mics came on before we said action, they would stay on the video would say rolling afterwards. Like you get all that great content before and after the interview too. Yeah. And I'll share that. I have deployed that technique in terms of, uh, both intentionally or just luckily where I don't tend to stop. And I'm uh, on our team, I'm usually, I'm audio. Um, and then um, Kyle and Seth are some combination of uh, photo and video. Um, and so if you're really gonna use it when it's a video project, you kind of need both rolling and both nobody breaking down or, right. or breaking up the scene. When we were doing more audio only, one, I believe, I firmly believe that there's a beauty to audio because they'll forget a microphone, especially if it's clipped to their shirt, much quicker than they'll forget a camera. Yeah. But on the other hand, you get finished with it and you're like, I wish we had video. So, <laughs> um, but in terms of, um, let's just call them like civilian makers that you're interviewing, some have experience with cameras, some don't. Um, I do think the same, the, the, those sentiments need to always apply, meaning I try to create the environment, like we said, cut. I try to get into a conversation. I try to be the, the energy leader that's going to um, develop a conversation that has them go through that same process, whether I said cut or not. Yeah. All right. So like, to me, that's the goal is the first few questions might be repetitive and you might not use them. But I think a good interviewer, I try to aspire to be an interview who's going to help people get into a place where they're comfortable talking and sharing. 
and then then we can go wherever and that's going to drop their shoulders and there's a few different thoughts about how and why and i don't think i'm i don't know that i don't have them listed like here's my <laughs> five points right nor would i share them probably uh, but <laughs> but i guess i would i mean i don't think you're not tricking anybody i just oh no it just kind of i try to get them thinking about a memory describing a memory in their life instead of telling me what they're trying to accomplish because one is intellectual and one goes to a different part of ourselves and we can see it hear yeah. it remember who we were with and like you know if i ask you who was your first beer with you're going to start describing you're immediately going to be talking in a more personable way than what's important about a first beer right right yeah where you got to, ah, hold on let me think about how i feel about it <laughs> what is right. he really asking me um and do i look stupid those are all things that are going to jam you up versus like, oh yeah. 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 Especially when you go back into memory and, and think of things that, you know, especially take you to a happy place. You're just kind of like, oh yeah, shit. I want to tell you about this. Right. And it yeah. just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I've got a, a question and that I'm stealing from Fred, uh, kind of just, uh, changing <laughs> the, the, moving a little bit from the, the documentary, but staying with the beer thing or beverages. And it's if you guys could sit down with anybody alive or dead, um, oh. and have a and have a beer or um, a cocktail or coffee, whatever is uh, on your agenda today, who would that be, and why would you want to sit down with them, um, Seth? Oh, hands down, without even thinking about it, it'd be Tom Waits. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Now, what about Tom? Is makes you want to sit down and and, and what what? One thing, which which beverage would you prefer to sit down with him with? <laughs> I don't really. I, I'm mostly a beer drinker nowadays. Uh, but if it's Tom Waits, I feel like you'd probably need to have some whiskey. I was going to say, it sounds like a, a uh, an old... maybe a whiskey beer. Um, <laughs> but the point is, he would have to invite me to his house so that we could go out into his barn and make uh, and music, break drums and shit. <laughs> that would be awesome. And just like just listening, you know. I I don't know if you've watched him in interviews, but yeah, I think that's not exactly a put on. I think he's really speaking like how his brain is wired, which is not like most people. So yeah, I, I just want to keep setting him up to just let him riff. <laughs> That's well, awesome. <laughs> uh, Kyle, how about you? Uh, I would, the first person that jumps to my mind is, is Hunter Thompson. Um, awesome. But probably like mid to late sixties, Hunter Thompson, not, yeah. <laughs> not full blown cokehead Thompson. <laughs> like, you know, right. Right. When he was getting started, getting some popularity and he was, when he was doing the Derby maybe, or, yeah, yeah, Derby yeah. and Fear and Loathing era, like yeah, that that yeah. time period when he first started writing for Rolling Stone. Yeah, like that that era. If I could sit down with him and Ralph Steadman at the same time and have oh, drinks yeah. with those guys. Yeah. Um, and I think just like Seth, it would have been a beer and a whiskey, but probably whiskey would be the <laughs> the main drink of that that evening. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Not even out of a glass. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, straight. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Fred, how about you? Yeah. I tell you, I've asked this question to a lot of people and I, I never gathered how uh, difficult or unfair it feels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, one, I feel fortunate that I've been able to have uh, beers or visits with people partly from projects like this that are, that are beyond uh, what one could hope for. So that feels good. And then you kind of have the personal versus the celebrity side. So I've thought of this, so I feel like I can't, uh, I'm going to move forward with it, which is, um, cause it's compelling, which is my mother. I lost my mother when I was a kid. Oh. Um, so I don't, you know, I didn't have that adult, uh, opportunity to become peers like yeah. I have with my father and other people in my family. So I think it'd be pretty cool to, uh, cause I was four. So, um, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. I couldn't, once that came into my mind, I couldn't think of anything better than that. That'd be, yeah. uh, that'd be out of this world. Awesome. And uh, w would you think you you and your mom would share as far as a beverage? Uh, 
you know, my guess is something in the porter stout variety, uh, <laughs> a nice roasty balanced beverage, maybe at the kitchen table. Excellent. Excellent. Maybe on the, maybe on front porch somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, so what are, what are all three of you have on tap, uh, going forward? I know you're all, um, busy guys, you know, with a bunch of different projects going on. Anything you want to give a shout out for what you're working on right now? Um, Kyle, how about you? We'll start with you. I, um, God, I'm working on a million different projects that I can't talk too much about right now. <laughs> I've been slowly over the last six months ago or so transitioning into uh, working in film and TV. And um, I'm doing behind the scenes photography and stills photography. Um, so I'm on a set two or three nice. days a week at, at most right now. And it's, it's picking up as we get into the cooler weather. Um, but it's one of those things where like, I can take photos, but I can't show them, right. you know, for like three months or something like that. Or if I'm lucky, a poster will come out and I can share that with everyone. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I've been doing. Um, and waiting for gas prices to come down so I can come back over to Michigan and hang out with all of you guys. Awesome. <laughs> not, not spend and a couple you... hundred dollars to do it. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, you should share the one that just came out. Cause you did just get to share. Uh, a poster and a movie and a project that you've been doing yeah um there's so actually tomorrow there's a short film coming out called blood pressure um which was done for a really cool um project that's nationwide called 48 hour film project um cool a film is is you you get a a, a little um like a genre is handed to you by this this organization and you have to write and film an entire um short film in 48 hours um, wow. start to finish uh, which is insane um and like a week after that, I worked on this movie called Snail that's coming out in January. Um, that's a really heartfelt um, short film. I think it's going to be like a 45 minute film. Um, and there's only one word of dialogue in the entire film. So it's going to be really interesting to see how they how they navigate that in the edit. Yeah. Awesome. That's a lot of pressure on the audio guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there was there was a guy there with a one job. The entire thing. Yeah. You got one job. You screw that up. <laughs> Trouble. Uh -oh. Fred, how about you? What, what's on tap for you? Well, um, many hats as usual. So um, Seth and I are working on something that Kyle has been involved with at times. But um, so my other life at Red Horse Center for Collaborative Leadership, we do equine assisted facilitation. So we're helping anything from therapy to team development, team building with teams and groups and businesses. and um, so aside from being a facilitator and a nonprofit that does that work, I'm also on a team that trains people to do that work. And we do that uh, these days, we've developed an online virtual uh, experience that film that uses films of sessions oh, cool. and the facilitators talking about what's going on so that we can train other facilitators in the work. And so the three of us worked on that last, when I think it was last summer, um, and now we just shot another um, bunch of that stuff uh, a couple weeks ago. So Seth and I will be editing over the winter on that. Um, we've got other creative projects. Um, continue to move forward with the Great Beer State podcast. Uh, we This project sort of interrupted our pace a little bit, but we'll have <laughs> a lot of episodes coming out over the winter. Cool. Uh, so that's going to stay alive. And um musical project great lakes brass and strapping owls are two projects great lakes brass played spring beer festival and has some uh interesting stuff up for the winter and um so stay tuned for any and all of it awesome and, uh, people can check out i guess i went into talking point mode but you can check out um red horse and all the stuff we do at redhorse.red cool and I'll um, put together, well, there'll be a post about this on Life in Michigan. We'll put uh, links to all that. So if you guys, uh, yeah, you know, perfect. Just, yeah, perfect. put them out there. Uh, Seth, so, but it's you? fun. And oh. we're headed to, I'm not sure when this is coming out, but I'm headed to Detroit Fall Beer Festival. We're going to have a viewing on Friday night on the 21st. Yeah. Um, well, location is unannounced. It'll be in the Corktown area. So all right. on Friday night around 8. Um, Fantastic! That sounds drink good. Drink some beers and um, and watch the film. Excellent. Yeah, this will definitely come out before 
because uh, I want to get it out before the uh, fall beer fest. And now mm -hmm. I'm super intrigued about Friday night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, we're just we're just wrapping up some details about the where and how and what and, cool. and getting word out. So that'll happen. And then there'll be a toast Saturday at the festival. We're going to try and gather as many of the, you know, characters of the scene yeah. um, for a uh, 25th anniversary toast. Interestingly enough, uh, so if people have been listening to any of this or reading any of it, you've heard the story of Hamilton Street Pub come up a million times. Yeah. Um, or Saginaw. What was that dive bar? Yeah. So, you know, the first time, I guess it was about 40 people got together to talk about whether the guild should be a thing. Um, we went to Hamilton Street Pub uh, in Saginaw. And it was October 22nd, 1997. So which is a Saturday of Detroit, Detroit Ball Fe Fall Beer Festival. So I just think that's amazing. It is. Uh, coincidence. And uh, so I plan to raise beer to on the 22nd as yeah. well as 21st. <laughs> awesome. And uh, Seth, how about you, man? What's going on? Uh, well, like Fred said, we just got back from Minnesota uh, shooting for Arenas for Change. And... That's one that I, I mean, I hope that there's a whole lot more. I hope that that's the start for me, that uh, that's the start of more stuff like that, because I'm not a horse person, but watching what those animals do as sensitive prey, I mean, I could go on and on and on about yeah. it. And I, and I have, every time I come back from that, I was like, man, you, like they know exactly all your bullshit like the second you walk onto the branch that horse knows everything about you and it's so it it looks like a magic trick but anyway so, so yeah like fred said there's a big edit coming on that um and then i'm doing i just wrapped a video i honestly wasn't sure i'd be able to do this zoom call because it was uh i'm doing a video for meals on wheels fundraising gala tomorrow oh cool uh, and of course we started shooting about the same day that i said i should be i should be delivering a first edit to you <laughs> that's the day that we started shooting so i the last week no, it's I, not just me no, <laughs> no, i mean it's fun it's a fun exercise to say so the events tomorrow that means we should have a final edit on this day, which means that I should give you a first edit on this day, which means we should be shooting on this day. It's a fun exercise. It never happens that way, <laughs> but it's fun to say just in case that should happen. <laughs> I think then, I imagine your goal, Seth, is just to have that conversation before that first day that you should be shooting. If you're having the conversation before it, and it's even a potential, that would be progress. Yeah. yeah. Like, so we should be shooting two months ago. Right. Yeah. You know. right. yeah. Well, you know, just like always, but everyone's like, yeah, that's a great idea. We'll get going on that right now. We'll start getting interviews lined up and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stand by the phone and wait, wait for you to tell me. But, uh, but th that's every single project. Yeah. Um, that I'm involved in anyway. Uh, other, otherwise, uh, I'm, I'm actually, as we're speaking, downloading hundreds of vintage photos because I'm putting another fundraiser video together for, I don't know if you've heard it, but uh, Valley Field here in Grand Rapids is an old baseball field. Oh. Um, like, I'm not a baseball person, but apparently it's historically really significant. Like the, the Black Sox played here. Oh, wow, cool. Um, uh, Satchel Page pitched at that field. Uh, it's a it's a big deal, and it's yeah. gotten kind of run down. And they need to raise. Uh, I think the city said they'd give them a million, but they're on the hook for like another two point seven. Wow! To get it all put together, um, and then I actually have three shoots coming in today. I started. Uh, a reproductive health story uh, 
storytelling photo projects. Very nice. So it's been so far it's been women, but there and it will probably ninety percent ninety five percent be women, but it could be their partners yeah. also. Uh, yeah. uh, just telling in long form, telling their reproductive health story. Like we've had some some older women who knew what it was like pre row when it really was illegal. Right. Um, and that's been really fascinating. Yeah, that, I would that'll imagine. Be, that'll be ongoing until it's unnecessary. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully soon as opposed to later, but. On Instagram, where that, that goes. Yeah, hopefully it's unnecessary on November 8th, but. Right. I, that's cautious optimism is probably still ambitious, but. Yep, we can only hope. Well, well, guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Um, I just have one last question. Um, somewhat controversial, uh, so hopefully nobody gets offended, but pineapple or no pineapple on pizza, Kyle? Uh, no pineapple on pizza. <laughs> awesome. Seth? Uh, I think you can put whatever you want on whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And Fred? Yeah, I champion choice in pizza. I would say it's infrequently on my pizza. But uh, <laughs> right. done well, any pizza done well, uh, <laughs> it's all right by, in my book. Excellent. And I awesome. got a parting, a parting thought I wouldn't mind adding if it's Yeah, cool, go for it. Is that I think this was both an effort of ours in capturing these stories and putting together this this piece I, we worked i worked hard at at talking to people that i didn't know as well as people that i knew or whose stories i knew and knowing that i had a lot of information i had to kind of counter my own instincts of like oh i may not know everything oh let's how do we keep the door and the window open yeah and i just want to share from an ongoing point of view that no story is too small or too far afield to be part of this mosaic and um, that we did our best to kind of represent the community. There's people we wish we had in here that weren't. There's people I haven't met yet. Um, but as we continue to go and continue to collect stories, I just wanna share that from our point of view, which I think is also alongside the Michigan Brewers Guild, that every person in this community is contributing to what it is, what it can be, and what it will be in the future. And, and hopefully this gives a nod to that and um, just want to encourage everybody to keep doing their thing. We love it. And yeah. we'll keep listening and keep telling the story. Yeah. Keep telling the stories. I have, I have one last thing to add. Sure. Uh, as we were putting this together, I thought this is a great thing. But, you know, of course, 25 years ago, nobody thought we would be putting a video together. And so I'm putting it out there right now. I've already put some feelers out, but we should be shooting this exact same stuff for the cannabis industry, like right now. Oh, right. Uh, so I've reached out to some of the right people, but you know, the, the more more people we could reach out to, because I think that also is a very, very similar, different details, but very similar story. And, and it's happening faster. Right. Yeah, a lot, a lot faster. Of yeah. And I think there's a relationship too that I think, um, you know, loosely or not, I think the craft beer renaissance has paved the path for a lot of, um, or either been parallel to or contributed to helping a lot of other industries um, change their makeup in a short period of time. Yeah. I was in Portland a few years ago when they were having an explosion specifically with gin. Like oh. everybody in Portland had a gin distillery, which was amazing. But I don't, that wouldn't have happened if Michigan hadn't already started to explode with the craft beer. Right. Because that was only like five years ago or something like that. So it, it's definitely downstream of the craft beer explosion. Yeah. Somebody should travel the country and talk to a bunch of makers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Just saying. Yeah, it's and dovetailing Kyle, right back in. 
Kyle could drink all the gin he wanted. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I can. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Chuck, thanks for thanks for talking yeah. with us. Really Thank love. You. Yeah. Thanks, Chuck. Been, yeah. No problem. Been a great I, member of the community for a long time, and I just I, always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, definitely appreciate you guys taking the time to to talk with me, and uh, look for hopefully uh, see all of you soon at some point in time. I know Kyle. We gotta wait for the gas prices to come down. I got, I got you, buddy. But uh, Fred, hopefully I'll see you in a couple weeks. Seth, you I don't know if, if you'll be around there, but all right. Well, thanks again, guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Have a good one.